Colossians chapter 1 are, in many ways, uh, we are, we are scaling the Mount Everest of Christian theology this morning. Um, this is one of those passages that remind us that there really is more weight in certain sections of scripture than there are in other places. And um, so this is one of the weightier places where uh, we get to jump into scripture. And, and consequently, these passages have had a profound impact. There has an impact on things that you and I believe and trust without thinking uh, that we have no idea where the origins of those ideas made their way down the stream of Christian history and theology to get where we are today. But this, a passage like this one has had quite a profound effect on uh, the history of Christian doctrine and in particular uh, a, a field of theology that's simply known as Christology which is our doctrines and understanding about Christ. But remember that there are there are doctrines that celebrate what the scriptures proclaim. In that area, we are safe to be bold. And if we are at the point in our faith where we can even trust without the ability to know how it all works, the happier we are. But there are also sets of doctrines in the Christian faith that are organize to answer the question either why is it this way or how does it work I would implore you to know the, to, to discern the difference between those doctrines that celebrate and expound upon the truth of scripture and those doctrines that then go beyond the boundaries of scripture to offer explanation that helps our human existential frustrations. And so those are doctrines that attempt to answer why God does this and how God do does this, even though the scriptures didn't record exactly why or how God does that. Those are the doctrines that you have to be very discerning about because you will have to have some of those convictions in order to help intelligently navigate communicating your faith. But you have to remember that any doctrine that expounds upon the question of how, why or how, but that those things are kept mystery in scripture, those doctrines are at the end of the day are only theories. And those theories have been organized by men, and throughout history, mostly men, but some women, but they've been organized by, by men and women who were attempting to bring organization to their understanding of the faith. I am not condemning that, but I am saying that we have to be discerning and realize that is not on par with the authority of the Spirit and what is clearly revealed in Scripture, even if what is clearly revealed still keeps us scratching our heads. Because God seems to invite us into the mystery rather than being the rationale that explains the mystery. And so it's important to know what your goal is whenever you're going to study the Scriptures. Because the closer we align ourselves with the heart of God, the happier and more content we will be. And again, let us remember, there were two trees in the garden. One of them was a mystery. You didn't have all your answers, all your questions answered immediately. In fact, the only answer you were given were, I don't know, let's walk in the cool of the day and let's talk. Let's let's." walk with one another and enjoy one another in intimacy. And that's one choice. But the other choice is, no, I got to know. I got to know why. I got to know how. In fact, I want to eat of the fruit that will make me wise like God. And we have struggled with that ever since. Whether you are religious or irreligious, we have to remember that our ideologies are always in some way an extension of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And although they may be helpful in helping communicate our faith, 
Our ideologies and doctrines about Christ are not the same way, are not the same thing as the person of Christ. So we have to remember the difference and we have to let our allegiance and loyalty go to the living Christ. So this morning, as we contemplate this Mount Everest of Christian theology, our point is very simple, and in, the, in, and in the vastness of what Paul celebrates, our point and takeaway is very simple, and it's this. Following Jesus is the fruit of embracing the revelation that we are created and held together by Christ, through Christ, and for Christ. Let's read our text, Colossians 1, verses 15 through 17. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, and all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and by him all things hold together. Now, we're just going to look at those three verses this morning. We were going to go um, uh, 15 through 20, but we'll save the second half uh, for next week. And let's just look at those three verses because these verses are so magnificent in what they are communicating. They are so optimistic. They are so full of hope and glory that only Christian doctrine can rob you of the joy of them. Because what Christian doctrine wants to do is swoop in and put boundaries around this magnificent proclamation that's being made from Paul. And so what I wanna encourage you to do is to be open to what the Spirit is saying to you. And if explanations have caused your awe and wonder to shrink, Allow the Spirit to set you free from puny, man-centered explanation and just jump into the deep waters of this mystery and swim and float on your back and laugh and bask in this magnificent vision of the thoroughness of God's love, grace, and power that we see in Jesus. So we're going to walk through this text. The first phrase, of course, is, He is the image of the invisible God. And we talked about that last week. But, but, at, but we're going to look at, we're going to start with the, this phrase, the firstborn of all creation. But first of that, I put it in your notes. I want you to take a look the way this little section is broken up because it's really important. Because one emphasis grows out of the previous emphasis. And so I think, and Paul even makes it easy because he says things like for and for this reason, because he does want us to understand there are some crystal clear things in scripture and we wanna, we wanna dive in and pay attention when they're crystal clear. So what Paul has done and the way he's arranged these verses, these six verses is first of all, he talks about Christ as being Lord over creation. That's very, very important for Paul. And again, I'm not gonna go too much into it because we went into it quite a bit last week, but. It's very important that we understand, that Paul wants us to understand that when, we, when he is talking about Christ, he is talking about something cosmic and universal. And so what he's wanting to do is to make sure that his readers understand the Christ he's talking about is the presence of the creator God way before Genesis 1.1. And so he, he emphasized that. So Christ is Lord over creation. Secondly, Christ is uh, Lord over over the new creation, the church. Christ is Lord over the creation. He is Lord over the new creation, the church. Is the, and then we'll look at that next week. Now, another word other than Lord that you'll see in this verse is the idea of supremacy. So one way we could say it is this. Paul is saying in verses 15 through 17 that Christ is supreme in creation. In fact, he calls him the image of the invisible God and the firstborn. And he said the reason why he's the image of the, of the visible God and the reason why he's the firstborn is because, in verse 16, it's because he's the creator. And then he kind of restates what he just said in the previous verses. Then next week we'll see, he jumps in in 18 through 20, he anticipates what he's going to say, and then he makes his proclamation. 
Jesus is the beginning and the firstborn. And why is he the firstborn in the beginning? Because he is the redeemer. So he is supreme because he's creator and he is supreme because he's redeemer is essentially kind of the, 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 the basic outline of this little paragraph. So let's take a look at this. Verse uh, Colossians 1 15 B. He is the firstborn over all creation. Now immediately we have to take just a minute and, and drink our coffee and pull up our chairs and chat just a little bit about what this means. Uh, but because when at first reading, when we read this and we read firstborn, our minds say that means he was born first. And so we read that word as a word of quantity. You got three kids, one, two, three. The first one is the firstborn. The second one is the secondborn. The third one is the thirdborn. That's kind of how we tend to read that. Now, if we go too far into that, we will find ourselves right in the middle of a heresy that the early church greatly fought because the heresy was that Jesus was a created being. He didn't always eternally exist. He was created by God. And there is a, and you can just do the Google for your church history and history of Christian doctrine. Lots of fascinating things that went on during that time as literally the church was kind of duking it out over this idea. But I'll tell you, uh, this word is not a quantitative word. It is a qualitative word. So whenever Paul uses the word firstborn, and we're not going to take time to do this, but if you're interested, go back through the Old Testament and see how this word firstborn is used there because it's often used of Israel throughout the Old Testament. And clearly what it's talking about is a different status or privilege. It is not a quantitative word, it is a qualitative word. Now, for example, when you say that I'm the four firstborn of Arthur and Cheryl, you are thinking like mere men because you were saying I was the first son that they had. My brother doesn't have a problem with, oh, he's not here. Oh yeah, he's back there. Oh no, he's on the computer. I got to be cautious. My brother wouldn't have a problem with that. When I say the term firstborn, unlike you mere carnal thinking Christians, I'm thinking spiritual and I th I'm saying that means superiority. Now my brother has a really hard time with that concept, right? Because it's inappropriate for a human to take that on. But that is what it's talking about. Christ is supreme. That's what it means by the fact that he is the firstborn. And, and Paul will go on to, 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 to uh, emphasize this. It's the idea that Christ is preeminent over all the rest of creation because the revelation being he's the one that created it. Verse 16, for everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Now let's just take a few minutes and meditate on this truth. Everything was created by him. All things have been created through him. All things have been created for him. Another way that we could emphasize these three dimensions that Paul is separate, separating is that Christ is the source of life, Christ is the means of life, and Christ is the ultimate end of life. Christ is the cause and means of and I'm going to add that I didn't, this was not David's fault, this was mine at, at 4.30 this morning. Christ is the cause and the means and the sustainer of creation. That's what Paul celebrates. He is the cause, the means, and the sustainer of creation. I'm gonna pause here because I know that I'm talking uh, in, in terms that are either like real, this is obvious, or this is really deep. I'm not sure where you are in that. But what I want you to think about is the implications of this truth. Because 
Oftentimes, we might read this and say amen, but we don't really carry out what the implications of that actually might mean. And in order to keep myself from getting into too much trouble, I'm going to let the Holy Spirit lead you to that rather than doing that his job for him. But I really, we need to process the implications of this truth. So I want to read to you a comment by David Garland, who wrote a commentary on Colossians and Philemon. And he writes this about this verse. Christ has precedence over all things in terms of time and status and is a kind of divine glue or spiritual gravity that holds creation together. God did not simply start things off and then withdrew from his creation. Christ continues to sustain the whole universe. As H.C.G. Uh, Mao memorably put it, he keeps the cosmos from becoming chaos. He keeps the cosmos from becoming chaos. He is the basic operating principle controlling existence. The universe is not self-sufficient, nor are individuals no matter how much they may, may deceive themselves into thinking they are. Even those who do not acknowledge Christ's reign and those who actively oppose him are entirely dependent on him. I have believed for years that this is exactly what this verse is teaching. And it created a conflict for me because I essentially grew up with the assumption that unless someone was a conservative, fundamental, charismatic Christian, they were something of a lesser quality than I. Um, even other Christians, but certainly non-believers, unbelievers, believers of other thought systems. But do we recognize that what Paul is celebrating is that there is something of the presence of Christ in everything that is living, in everyone who has ever taken a breath. There is something of the image of God and the presence of Christ in every single one of those individuals. Why? Because their atoms are held together by what? Jesus, I heard it whispered over there. They're held together by Christ. Now, as we think about this, it puts in light the reason why the core revelation of the Christian faith is that Jesus is Lord. In fact, this revelation is the reason why everyone ever created will embrace this truth. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Here's our phrase, so that. Now what so that is doing for us is setting us up mentally to understand that Paul is about to give the reason why God has highly exalted Jesus and bestowed on Jesus the name that is, on, that is above every name. It's so that at that name, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now think about the staggering implications of what Paul is celebrating here. The reason why God resurrected and exalted Christ is so that everyone could see, respond, and confess that he is the Lord. When we 
bear witness to our faith. The discerning evangelist listens to the stories of others and begins to recognize there's where the grace of God's at work in their life and they don't even know it. They begin to discern here's where Christ is present in their existence and they're unaware. And then we begin to bless from that place and help people to understand and see how God's goodness and love and grace has been pursuing them even when they've been facing the other direction. Because there is something of Christ holding everyone together. And what God, what, what Paul says is the reason why he's been resurrected is so that everybody could eventually see that he is the Lord. To confess that he is Lord is to recognize that the Christ of co-suffering love or the Messiah of co-suffering love is the sovereign king of all that has been created. 